shop up here in Walgaroo. Uh, we're opposite Diamantina Street there. I remember walking in and, you know, when you're going in and out of town all the time, you frequent the same shop. And so I got to know the different people that are there and you'd know the relationships between people, grandmas and daughters or grandmas and, and grandkids, et cetera, et cetera. I remember walking in one day and the, the, the young lady that normally worked there on that particular day wasn't there, but her grandmother was there. And I said, oh, where's so-and-so? And they said, oh, they've moved to Perth because she's living with her boyfriend. And I said, oh, how do you feel about that? And she goes, not sure. I said, no, how do you really feel about that? She said, well, I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's right but I'm not sure. See, we live in a world of not sure. And even in the church, sometimes we live in a world of not sure. You know, if you ask a question about philosophy, you'll get 10 different answers from 10 different gurus. And if you ask a question about morality, even within the church, you're going to get at least two answers. One, yes, you can do it, and one, no, you can't do it. If you ask a question about sexuality in this day and age, you often get more than the two answers. You get to choose because you're not sure. People will say, I'm not sure, or they'll say something, oh, do what's right for you, which is exactly the same thing. It's not taking a stance over everything. And so within the community and often even within the church, there are, are ideas or there are views that we hold that have subtly insinuated themselves into the church and, and infected Christians as well so that we too are not sure about certain things. And particularly... It's troublesome when it's about fundamental points of doctrine that we really need to know for sure. And there's a statement that, that I've heard from the mouths of both believers and non-believers. When it's said by a non-believer, it normally means, or it's normally their excuse to reject the gospel of Jesus. But when it's said by believers, I think it's often said to minimise the offensiveness of the gospel to people outside, but to minimise the effect of the gospel in our own lives. And the thing that people are not sure about, even after reading the scriptures, is that they're not sure whether Jesus actually claimed to be God. We're not sure. We haven't read our scriptures well enough. And in actual fact, that particular thing, whether Jesus really claimed to be God, is a fundamental question. It is a super important question to us, for us to know well. See, when we look at the, the question, the question is, did Jesus really claim to be God? And so when we look at the New Testament books, there's actually two parts to that question. The first one is whether Jesus himself claimed to be God. And the second question is, did the New Testament writers think Jesus was God? There are things that we should think about. There are things that we should contemplate as we come to the Scriptures. So before we read John 10 again, ask yourself these questions or, or keep them in mind. What message is John trying to get across? And in that particular situation when John's writing, who's listening to what Jesus says? Who's listening to what the other people in this little story? Who's listening? Who's involved in it? What is actually said? And then how did the people that heard Jesus talk react? So I'm going to read it again. So at, the, at that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem, John 10, 22. It was winter. And Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews, miscellaneous people, Pharisees, 
The people that normally hang around a church or a temple. Religious people are there. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, come on, how long are you going to keep us in suspense? It's about time, if you are the Messiah, if you are the Christ, just tell us plainly, we want to know. So who's he talking to? And Jesus answered them, I told you. And you do not believe. The very works, the works that I do in my Father's name, the things I've done out there in the paddock, the loaves and the fishes, the healing of people, etc., etc., raising people from the dead. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. But you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. It's self-evident, he's saying. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. And he says this, I and the Father are one. Did Jesus claim to be God? Really? Yeah. Jesus claimed to be equal with God. I and the Father are one. There's other things that only God can do. And I've got some of the verses up. I haven't got all of the verses up. Only God can forgive sin. And yet, Jesus would do that. Mark 2, 5 to 7. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. How did the people listening to that react? Some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? What does that say about the writer of this particular book, John? Mark, sorry, thank you. My mistake. But Mark is trying to say, okay, only God can forgive sins. He's letting us in on that. And then again in John 5, Jesus claimed power enough to raise the dead. In John 5, again, he is honoured as God. And then John 10, 30, he claims equality with God. And it goes further than that. Because secondly, if you think about it, firstly, Jesus claimed to be equal with God. But secondly, Jesus claimed to be, I am. Remember Exodus chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, it says this, When Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? Who or what shall I say to them? So God says to Moses, Just tell them, I am who I am. And he said to Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. That's the context. Then we come to John chapter 8, and Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And what did the people that heard this do immediately? It says, so they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Why did they pick up stones? Because Jesus is claiming equality with I am. He's claiming divinity. Not only did he claim to be I am, he claimed to to be exactly the same God, Yahweh. The God that is through the whole of the Old Testament. John 17, 5, it says this, And now, God, glorify me in your own presence 
end with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. He's claiming once again to be Yahweh. Then again in Revelation chapter 1 verse 17, Jesus claims to be the first and the last, but also Revelation 1.8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. Once again, Jesus claimed to be God. John 5, he claims to be the judge of all humanity. John 10, he claims to be the good shepherd. Matthew 25, he claims to be the bridegroom. All illustrations of his divinity, of his godhood. Then in John 8 and in other places, he claims to be the light of the world. Yeah, Jesus did claim to be God. Not only claimed to be I am and Yahweh, he also claimed to be the Messiah who was God. Think about this. Think back through what you know of the Old Testament that you've read in the Old Testament and the, ti the titles that we have from the Old Testament that are applied to him by the writers of the New Testament. Psalm 46, 45, sorry, and Hebrews 1, 8 show that Jesus is God. He's called Lord. Psalm 11 and Matthew 22. He's called the Ancient of Days. Remember Daniel? And then again in Mark. He's called the Messiah. All of these, the biblical writers write down for the Jews and other people to know that Jesus was God. It wasn't an accident. Another thing that we don't recognize and don't realize is that Jesus accepted worship as God. And if he was not God, he would not have accepted it. Throughout the Old Testament, people are commanded not to worship anyone but God alone. Yet Jesus accepts it over and over and over again. For example, the leper who worshipped him in Matthew 8, verses 2 and 3. And behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, Master, God, if you will, you can heal me. So Jesus stretched out his hand and touches him and says, I will. Be clean. And immediately the leprosy was cleansed. Then there is the, the ruler that knelt before Jesus after his son was healed. Then there's a Canaanite woman who once again bowed down and worshipped. There's a possessed man in Mark chapter 5. And the disciples themselves who knelt down and worshipped him and prayed in his name. Yeah, Jesus accepted worship as God. Another thing that if you look at the Gospels and, and, and after that in the New Testament, the people that followed Jesus, his disciples, recognized back then that Jesus was God. John 20 and Colossians 2, they call him God. They call him the Savior of the world in John chapter 4. They prayed to and they worshiped Jesus as part of the Godhead, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit in Matthew chapter 28, and again in 2 Corinthians. John taught from the very first verse of the book of John that Jesus was God. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. The very first line of his book, but I will say this, it is true in one sense that Jesus never came out and said, I am God. But he did claim to be God in so many different ways that it is absolutely obvious. And the people that heard him knew exactly what he was saying. 
Remember what we read in John 10.30? Jesus said, I and the Father of one. I and the Father am one. You remember Leviticus chapter 24, verse 16? Yeah, I'm sure that's something that you read before or after breakfast every single day. But Le Leviticus 24, 16 says, Whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him. The visitor as well as the native, when he blasphemes the name, I am, or Yahweh, he shall be put to death. And I didn't read John chapter 10 verses 31 to 33, but I'm going to. This is immediately what they were going to do to Jesus as soon as he said <coughs> those words, I am the Father of one. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. So evidently this is not the first time that they're ready to stone him for blasphemy, for claiming to be God. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father or from Yahweh, from God. For which of them are you going to stone me? And this is a very telling and a very interesting verse. The Jews answered him, it's not for your miracles. It's not for your good works that we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy, for claiming to be God. Because you, being a man, make yourself, or are telling us that you're God. The Jews knew he was claiming to be God. Another instance in John 8, so this is previously, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. The Jews knew exactly what he was claiming. And they tried to stone him for it. So that answers the first question. Did Jesus claim to be God? The answer is absolutely. There is no doubt he did and the Jews at that time knew what he was claiming. But there's another part, and that is, did the gospel writers state or declare that Jesus was God? And we have to know this. We have to know this daily because it is applicable to everything that we believe. Like I said, beginning of John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him was not anything that was made, was not anything made that was made. And in him was life and the light was the light of men. Now if that's not clear enough, in 1 John 1 verse 14, just a few verses later, John writes, And the word, or the logos, became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And we, we've seen his glory, Glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. <coughs> the very first verses of John and the very first chapter of John is absolutely affirming that Jesus is God. It shows that he left heaven, he came to earth, he became a man to live with us and to display the glory of God. Did the disciple know or did John know that Jesus was God? Absolutely. Absolutely. That is his whole mission of the book of John to tell us. Let's go get back to Matthew. We all get bored with the beginning of Matthew because it's just a list of names until we come to Matthew chapter 1, verse 16. And it says, And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called or who is named the Messiah, the Christ. There you go. First chapter of Matthew. The declaration of who Jesus Christ is. And also in there, his lineage. You can't see it or you don't, if you don't look carefully, it doesn't say Joseph, the father of Jesus. It says Joseph, the husband of Mary, from whom Jesus was born, who is called or named the Christ. 
There's so much theology hidden in that verse because we don't look at it as we should. And then in Luke chapter 1, verse 1, the very first verse, he writes, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us. What things? The things that he's writing through the next chapters, the things about Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, showing that we are witnesses to the things that we've seen. And then later on in the book, he tells us even clearer that Jesus is the Christ. Mark chapter 1, verse 1. Love it. The beginning of the gospel, the evangelion, the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. How much more blunt can you get? Did the disciples know that he was the Son of God? Of course they did. Maybe not before his resurrection, but all of these books are after the resurrection and they're thinking back by the Holy Spirit. What did he do? What did he say? Why did we miss it? But the disciples are declaring the divinity of Jesus Christ. And the thing is that we forget, if we have a look at the stories too, that Satan himself declares the deity of Jesus Christ. And Jesus declared himself to be God before Satan. Three times in Luke chapter 4, we hear of Satan trying to provoke Jesus. And he says, if you are the Son of God, now, we get turned off by the if, as if to say, well, what? Satan's not going to come out of his enjoying of our destruction by saying to just anybody, if you're the Son of God. No, he's going to go up to the Son of God. And he's going to say, come on. You're God. Come on, just do it. You're a man now, but I can take away all your suffering. What does Jesus say to him? And we will always read this one particular way and we forget that there's two ways that you can read Luke 4, 12. And Jesus answered him, declared to him, said to him, stated to him, told him off. It is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. That's not just saying don't provoke God. He's also saying directly to Satan, don't tempt me. Don't even try because God does not give in to Satan. Then after the resurrection, think about Thomas, we talked about him the other week. Gets down in the sense on one knee and says, my Lord and my God. And Thomas is the, is the stubbornness personified in a sense. And do you think that if Jesus was not God, if he wasn't Lord, that Thomas would have done that? No, he wouldn't have. Thomas spoke the truth. Think about some of the other stories. Before his death, Jesus walking on the water. And what do the disciples do? Acknowledge that he's God and start worshipping him there. After his death, they fell at his feet and they worshipped him. You can find that in Matthew chapter 29. And don't think that the disciples did this willy-nilly. Because the disciples were well aware that they were supposed to penalise, to kill anyone who commits blasphemy, who claims to be God. Yet they worshipped him as God and Jesus accepted their worship. You think back, Jesus never rebuked anybody for worshipping him. He accepted it as proper, as good and right. So, the divinity, the deity is Jesus is totally recognised through the whole of the New Testament. 
So one, did Jesus claim to be God? Absolutely. In so many ways, it is abundantly clear. So if you ever hear someone says, well, Jesus didn't really claim to be God, you can stand up and say, yes, he did. And the whole of the New Testament, if you think about it, is the declaration that Jesus is God. Paul writes in Titus 2, that he's waiting for the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. If that's not plain enough, then once again, Paul and John declare that Jesus created the universe, if that's not godly enough. And there's always the parallel in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, where it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, if that's not plain enough can only mean one thing and that is that Jesus is God and it was declared throughout the Old and the New Testament and finally I suppose in a sense God himself declares that Jesus is God Hebrews 1 verse 8 says this but of the son he the father I put that in brackets because that's what the he is referring to. God the Father. But of the Son, Jesus, he, the Father, says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. There's that equality. The scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. God the Father calls God the Son eternal and coexistent. God the Father refers to Jesus as God. Did Jesus say he was God? Yep. All the way through the scriptures, all the way through the New Testament, or the Gospels. And he applied the attributes of God to himself. He made it clear that he was God in human form. He proved it by his words, he proved it by his miracles, and he finally proves it by raising from the dead. And his disciples and the people around him, yeah, they doubted at first. But they were finally convinced when he rose from the dead. You've got to think of it this way. If he was just a man, then his death on the cross would have been sufficient because he was perfect, a perfect man, to pay for his own sins. Did you hear what I said? If he was a perfect man and just a perfect man, his death on the cross was sufficient to pay for just his own sins. But because he was God, because he is the most valuable person in the universe, his death on the cross was enough to pay for all of our sins. Because his sacrifice, we don't think it often, but his sacrifice was infinite. It covered everyone who would believe and is able to pay for, the, pay for the sins of all who would accept Jesus. I think there is a simple application as well as a complex application. And I'm not going to give the complex application, but I'm going to give the simple application. I think that the only time that we really doubt that Jesus is God is when we want to do something our own way. I think that when we look at the scriptures, it is obviously plain. It's stated, it's underlined, it's in bold. It stands out that Jesus Christ is God. And the only time we doubt is when we want to do something our own way. And if you think about it, Romans chapter 2 teaches us, or Romans chapter 1 teaches us that all people know that there is a God. And so once again, if you're not a believer... The reason that you doubt that Jesus Christ is God is because you want to do your own thing. You want to go your own way. So 
So take this with you this week. Let it give you strength. Let it keep you strong. Let it keep you focused on the road that you walk, as difficult as it may be, that we serve God. We serve Jesus Christ. And He is God. And don't doubt, because when you doubt, you start looking for another road to take. And let's not take any other road. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to keep our eyes fixed upon you. Help us to keep our eyes fixed upon Jesus. Give us the strength of the Spirit to always be walking in the direction that you want us to walk. Heavenly Father, if we have failed, if we have fallen, help us to have the humility, the regret, to fall to our knees and say, Father, forgive us. We knew what we did, but we doubted who you were. But now that we know once again who you are, we are forgiven in your Son's name. (coughs) Give us your Spirit. Cleanse us. Help us to live for you. Strengthen us this week. And Father, also I pray your blessing upon the mothers here today, that they will know that you love them and also I pray that their fathers will interact with them and show earthly love as well. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.